Great. So uh, thanks for having me. I have to say this is a pretty intimidating audience, having all these experts on birds, and then Alice, who's an expert on DNA sequencing in the same group. I don't know, I feel like I'm giving a job talk or something here, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, you're a very interactive group from what I can tell. So uh, anytime, just pipe up and ask some questions, happy to answer them. I think that'll uh, be fun for all of us. All right, can you go to the next slide, Scott? <coughs> So what I'm going to do is give a kind of a brief introduction to genomics, um, get into some specific details about bird genomes, uh, and then give a couple examples of genetic studies and the genetics of coloration and also the genetics of behavior. And Scott has these slides, as you know, he's presenting them. So if you're, I'm free to share them. There's, if there's any references in here you're interested in, he can pass those on to you. All right, next slide. Okay, brief guide to genomics. So what I'm gonna what we're talk about a lot today is the, the genome. And really that's basically just all the, the DNA that's in a cell. Um, it's organized into chromosomes. So you can see that down there at the bottom. Um, and individual species will have a different number of chromosomes. Um, it varies across taxa. And a chromosome is made up of, in part, the, the information on a chromosome that's most important and interesting to us are genes. So genes are basically linearly arrayed along these chromosomes. Scott just showed a picture of a gene array from bacteria, I believe. And so they're just placed along uh, the chromosomes and they're comprised of specific sequences of DNA that encode uh, both proteins. So that's kind of a physical manifestation of uh, what these genes are, kind of the functional end. And then there's information along the chromosome as well that tells uh, the machinery essentially or dictates when, where, and how much of any given gene is expressed, say in a given cell type or a time in development uh, or tissue type. So quite a bit of information obviously is encoded in these chromosomes. Uh, and the, the DNA itself is basically comprised of bases. They're shorthand for T, G, A, and C. You can kind of see it there in the middle right. Um, that's just shorthand for the, the chemical structures. Each nucleotide has its own structure. And so a chromosome really is just a long polymer of these bases. Um, T, G, A, and C, that's all it is. Uh, they can be anywhere from what we'll see in a little bit, uh, a few million bases long to hundreds of millions of bases long. So it's just one long strand and it's double stranded. So there's essentially, in a, in a way, two copies of the, the DNA there. And that's how it kind of replicates over time. All right, next slide. So uh, you probably have heard people refer to you know, sequencing a genome. Well, what, what does that really even mean? So what you're trying to do when you sequence a genome uh, is essentially determine the order of those nucleotides along the chromosome. It's as simple as that. And you say, okay, well, that's not, that shouldn't be a tough problem. Why don't you just start at one end of the chromosome and just walk down and basically determine what every single base is. But the fact of the matter is that the technology to do sequencing is incapable of that process. So you have to make the pro uh, uh, problem a little bit easier. So you start off with large pieces of DNA and you break them up into smaller pieces. And then those smaller pieces, you actually can determine the full sequence of. Uh, so for example, down here. And then the, the tough part is you're trying to piece that back together to reconstitute the linear uh, segments that were the chromosomes to start with. And you're using uh, computer algorithms to do this. Um, it's it's a rel still a relatively difficult process, but in the end, you can get what's called a, an assembled sequence. Uh, so basically an assembled genome or genome assembly. And for most studies in uh, birds or other animals, the first step you want to take if you want to 
leverage this kind of information is to get a, what's called a reference genome. So you take one individual and you do the best you can to reconstruct what those chromosomes look like. Okay. All right, next slide. The second type of thing that someone may be referring to when they say, oh, we're, we're gonna sequence a genome is after the fact that you've already created a reference genome, you say, well, let's sequence a bunch of other individuals. We, we've made our reference. Now we wanna sequence other individuals. Do we have to go back through that same process, which is kind of difficult to generate that reference assembly? And the answer is basically no. Most of the time, what you're interested in when you sequence other individuals from the same species, for example, is really what's different and what's similar between your reference bird and then these other individuals. And so what you do is you, <clears throat> you go back, you chop up the DNA and you generate a sequence from these molecules. And then you're saying, you're kind of doing a word search. You're saying, where does that string of nucleotides match the best in the reference genome? And then what you do is you say, okay, well, is it identical or are there some differences there? And what I'm showing here is an example where here's the, the reference sequence, just again, the strings of nucleotides. And then these are uh, representing individual pieces of DNA that were from say another, another individual. And they're all basically identical, uh, except at this one position here where uh, this read or the sequence has an A instead of a T. And so that's the kind of thing you're looking for. What's, what's the genetic variation in these individuals compared to the reference? So when you're doing this type of sequencing, you're really uh, using that reference as an anchor point to tell, your, to tell yourself, okay, this bird has an A and that bird has a T at this one position in the reference. So that's a very powerful uh, piece of information to, to keep all the information straight. It's, it's Again, these genomes are pretty big as you'll, I'll see, tell you in a second. And so this is a really valuable uh, tool to um, interrogate the genetics of these species. Okay, so in general, this is just a, some very basic numbers. If you were to compare the genome of two birds to one another, you, depending on the species, you might see anywhere from one in a hundred to say one in a thousand bases of these nucleotides that differ between those two individuals. Okay, so it's kind of a low percentage. And most of these differences uh, typically don't really have any functional consequence. So you're, you're gonna see a lot of differences, but most of them don't matter. So one of the big tricks is trying to figure out which, which of these differences in the genome between individuals really has some sort of phenotypic effect. Okay, all right, next slide. Okay, so into the, into the birds here. So um, again, some background for context. You know, these are just uh, values from the literature that I could pull. So, you know, all modern birds derive from a common ancestor from about 100 to 66 million years ago. Songbirds have a common ancestor about 40 million years ago. Bird genomes have about 20,000 genes. So that's fairly typical for vertebrate genomes. Mammals have about that many, some fish are a little bit funny, frogs can be weird because they're polyploid, but that's pretty standard. Genome size of birds tends to be about 1 billion base pairs. Uh, in comparison to humans, about 3 billion. Size doesn't really matter there at all in terms of information content per se. I mentioned uh, Different species can have different chromosome numbers, so not all genomes look the same per se in how they're organized. But in general, especially closely related species, the gene content and order along the chromosomes is generally conserved uh, across species that are especially closely related. So if you knew the order of genes in, in uh, uh, one bird and another one is just like a million years diverged, that gene order is gonna be highly predictive of what's in that other species. And in general, uh, although there's a, right, a massive uh, diversity of phenotypes, 
in birds or across vertebrates. Really, there's a kind of a core set of genes that are present in all these animals. And it's almost uh, a, a kind of a combination of when and where these genes are expressed and the actual protein differences themselves that lead to those phenotypic differences. It's not really the creation of a lot of new genes that's causing uh, new phenotypes. It's kind of tweaking what's already there. So, sorry, Thomas, would, would you mind for those who are not uh, in the field to uh, give a, a, a definition of a phenotype? Oh, sure. Phenotype is basically just uh, something that you can see, like white hair, black hair, any, anything you can basically measure or observe. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's a trait, um, sometimes morph, you know, different, different ways. Of th yeah. Thanks. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay. Next slide. Okay. So here is uh, just an example of uh, the chromosomes from a specific bird. I'm not even gonna, I I'm, just, I'm just scared to say anything about these birds because you know way more about them than I do. So <laughs> you know what the bird, I'll tell about the chromosomes. So this bird has 39 pairs of chromosome, autosomes. So chromosomes that are present in both males and females. And then it also, in this case, is a female because it has a Z and a W chromosome as well. So uh, and then males would have a would both have two Z chromosomes, so it's a little bit different than in uh, obviously different than in mammals where males are XY. So th this is called the females or the heterogametic sex is the term for that. In any event, uh, this is a process whereby you can basically visualize these chromosomes from an individual cell, and as I was mentioning, the size can vary quite a bit um, from you know again I'll, I'll see, show you on the next slide as well, but. There's really no magic here. The chromosomes are numbered based on size. And if a, bird, if a different bird has a different number of chromosomes, then it's just gonna be based on size again. There's no magic in the naming of these chromosomes. Okay, next slide. So here's a hummingbird genome karyotype on the left. And then what's shown on the right is a plot uh, showing the correlation in the estimated size, just based on physical size that you can see the chromosome through a microscope versus the genome assembly size. And essentially what they're showing here is that there's very good correlation between what would essentially be the predicted size of the genome assembly and what they actually see when they put it back together. So this is kind of a validation stage. Um, quality control aspect to doing these assemblies. It's a very complicated process. You wanna make sure as best you can that it's a good assembly. And again, here's, here's the size here is about 150 million base pairs was the largest chromosome. And then the smallest were under 3 million base pairs. Okay, next slide, Scott, thanks. Okay, so well, how would you sequence a bird? How are you gonna do this? So here's a, a, a high level overview how this gets done. So first you gotta get some DNA. Uh, you can, in birds, because the red blood cells are nucleated, you, you just need a small amount of blood or you can use the tissue to extract the DNA. Um, typically when they're gonna do a reference genome assembly, you probably start with the female so that you can include both chromosomes in your reference, the Z and the W. Then you prepare the DNA for sequencing. You can't, there, there's machines that sequence DNA, but you can't just push uh, raw DNA into these machines, you essentially have to prepare them such that the machine recognizes and then can process the DNA. Um, and this is what is called creating actually a library, something Alice knows very well. Um, and to create a library might take, you know, one to three days, it, it varies a little bit. The sequencing part where you put it on a machine that's going to do this might take a day to two to three days for an entire genome. Not much time at all, actually. Uh, computer, you then, okay, then the data comes off. You've got all this data. What are you gonna do with it? Use computer um, assembly programs to essentially try to piece all that information back together to get those chromosomes or to compare your reads to a reference genome. And then if you're, again, creating this reference, you go through an analysis phase where you're trying to figure out where are the genes, um, make sure it looks right. Does this compare it to other genomes? Does it make sense? 
and that can take months. So the actual process of actually doing the sequencing from say extracting the DNA to it coming off these sequencing machines is not, not much time, but it's a really kind of a lot of uh, detailed analysis after the fact that what takes the time in this in the sequencing process. Uh, current cost to generate a really good reference genome and you know we're kind of aficionados about sequencing and putting these genomes together it would cost like five to ten thousand dollars at this point. Um, compare that to, to th uh, the genome assembly of the chicken which was the first bird that was sequenced and assembled and that cost 13 million dollars in 2004. So a much more accessible type of experiment um, than it has been in the past. That resequencing step where you're just comparing to a reference might cost $100 to $200 a bird, could be less. And from what I can tell in uh, the databases that store these sequences, that there's probably about 500 reference bird genome sequences available. So that's uh, quite a tremendous number uh, considering there may be 10,000 species or something like that. So uh, quite impressive um, sampling so far on the birds. All right, next slide, Scott. So one of the things you might be asking is, well, what do you, what do, you do with the sequence? Uh, and here, here's some over, you know, broad overviews of what you do with it. So you can build a species tree. Now you can say, well, can't you do that on more, based on morphology? You guys can recognize birds like nothing, you know, you're very good at it. Uh, the question is, the, the, the only difference here is that the DNA um, is a very dense data source, high information content. And so you can get uh, some really fine resolution on the relatedness and kind of essentially the time, likely time of divergence between certain species of birds. You can do all sorts of things related to uh, kind of relatedness within a population. You can look at things like population structure. So if any of you have done ancestry.com and found out that your ancestors were from wherever, um, you could do the same kind of thing in birds. You would just need to build up kind of a database of where birds from a given population came from. Uh, the main things though are, you can now look at for genetic differences between individuals and species, which is kind of what we were showing with that resequencing. And then it's also a, really a strong starting point to link these genes to traits, coloration, whatever you want to talk about, uh, behavior, really anything. Okay. Um, just in terms of the species trees, I think it's true, you can correct me, but I think the tanagers was a real mess and most of them or many of them were not tanagers and so that's all been changed by uh, the ge genetics. But, right um, and this is one of the um, one of the aspects of DNA sequence there, there's really no it's I wouldn't say it's unbiased but there's no kind of upfront assumptions you're really just looking at similarities you're, you're basically when you do these comparisons of the DNA you're you're essentially looking at the past and trying to reconstruct what happened. Um, and I think the DNA is probably the best measure or record of history uh, compared to the, what you see in the bird right now. So, and especially right, like as Scott is mentioning, when you get into kind of dense speciation events, it's really hard to untangle <clears throat> the relationships uh, without using a lot of information like DNA sequence. Okay, all right, great. <clears throat> So uh, the first kind of topic I wanted to touch on was uh, plumage and coloration genetics. So again, a remarkable amount of diversity in birds with respect to coloration. I don't need to tell you that. Um, there's a couple aspects of related to uh, genetics that are of interest here. So um, the melanins provide pigmentation in some respects for like brown and black pigmentation, yellow and reddish brown. Um, for example, no pigmentation would be like, it would essentially be white uh, or albino, be another way to think about it. 
the interesting thing about the melanin pigmentation is it's conserved across vertebrates. So while you don't know up front what genes could influence coloration or plumage in any given bird, you know that there is a set of genes that do influence uh, pigmentation in many other species. So therefore there are candidates when you go in to look for this kind of thing in birds that are kind of ready to go. So if you, if you search for it, you already have some idea what genes might be involved in that. There's also the carotenoids, where uh, as far as I can tell are in um, influence orange, red, and yellow colors. You get those from the diet. Uh, again, there's gonna be genes that are involved in that coloration as well, but the genetics are not, as far as I can tell, not as well defined as with the um, melanins and pigmentation. And then there's other ways that you get coloration. Um, for example, the structure of the feathers can influence it where the melanin is deposited. Um, and again, that the genetics of that are not as well defined either. Okay, so the uh, next one. All right, so here's an example. And again, chime in if anyone's seen these birds or been there, happy to hear stories. You, um, so this is the Iberia seed eater. Uh, this is uh, a bird that is, as you can see down on the bottom here, where it is in South America and the, the environment that it lives in. The interest in this study was that there are two of these species that have overlapping ranges, which are essentially kind of shown on the right there with the red and blue dots where they found, I believe, the mating pairs. And they're very, from what they could tell, very closely related in terms of genetics that there was a rapid speciation of this um, closely related species of maybe 10 species in a million years. So quite a few recognized species coming about in an estimated very short amount of time. Um, they have overlapping ranges. So the question is, how do you go from one population probably a million years ago into 10 different species? That's kind of the question they're asking here. What is the genetic basis behind that differentiation? What's driving them to become independently, uh, independent populations or species that are preferentially mating with each other and not intermixing like they had in the past? Their, uh, their thought was that male traits reinforce speciation. And so they are interested in kind of pursuing this from a a genetic point of view. And um, what, what's shown up here is you've got the males from, uh, again, the, these species names are gonna kill me, Hyposantha, which are orange, Iberanius, uh, which are more of a dull color. And then the females from both of these species basically look, uh, are, are indistinguishable from what they, what they said, okay. And actually the, the, the Iberensis, they, they said they just started to observe it like 20 years ago. So is it really just 20 years ago that this species arose? Probably not. But anyway, that's what, um, why they're particularly interested in this, in this comparison. Oh, sorry, next slide, Scott. So they, they did a, one functional test here unrelated to the genetics where they're just asking the question of, well, I think that the coloration is important for how these birds are recognizing their mates, right? And a probably song as well. And so here, all they did was they were just trying to quantify that by putting these models in the wild in a, in a male's territory, and then looking at the response for these territorial males to same species, different species, or a species that doesn't live in the area. Uh, and then mixing the song, whether it's the same species song or a opposite species song. And basically what they're showing is that from the field study, this found that both the song and the coloration are important for this territorial male response. So basically just saying, yeah, these birds are recognizing, and again, I'm not a surprise that, you know, if I'm orange, another orange male, that's my competitor. This other guy, I don't have to worry about him. They didn't talk about the females here, but that's kind of the inference that there's some, some way that they're recognizing who's who. 
Okay, next one, Scott. All right, so here, here we'll get into the, how did they do this study in terms of the genetics? So what, they, what they're doing here is they wanna ask the question, okay, I know we have these two species, the males look different. Um, how can we, how can we find, can we find places in the genome where the, the orange birds all look similar, the, the non-orange birds all look similar, but between the two groups, there's a big difference. Okay, so that's, that's the question. Where are these places where it's consistently different between the two uh, species? And so what they can do is they, they resequenced uh, about 20 individuals from both species. So they're gonna, and then compared it to a reference. Now they're gonna look at all the variable sites across the genome. And I think there were 13 million. So many, many positions. And they're just asking again, that question, where do they see places where you see a strong signal of these variants are present mainly in the orange or almost always in orange but not in the other species. And so what they found were actually three locations on three different chromosomes that met that criteria. Um, in between there, but most of the genome actually, if you randomly selected a portion of this genome um, and looked at those 20 birds in each species and looked at that DNA, you would not be able to predict uh, which species that DNA came from. So most of the genome looks like it's actually from the same population, that these two species represent essentially one interbreeding population. So they're very, it's a very recent or incipient speciation event that's happening here. So the, one of the interesting things, a couple of interesting things about these three regions that they found and zoomed in on is that number one, there were two, uh, two of these regions contain pigmentation genes or known pigmentation genes. So from that point of view, it, it's very likely that the variation in those regions is driving the different differences in coloration uh, between the two species. They don't know exactly which change it is, but they know those regions are involved. And then the other interesting thing that they found was that these three regions uh, they went and looked at, I mentioned there was a kind of a cluster of 10 species in this group. They went back to look at these regions in those 10 species, and they found that these kind of flavors of the genes that are present uh, in the one species, <clears throat> the Iberensis, are actually, are there in the other species, but they're not there in this specific combination. So this combination of three regions is unique to the Iberensis. I, sorry, I had a typo there on the, on the slide. So that's interesting that the kind of the, the difference that they're observing between these two species is the result of kind of a new combination of alleles that were already present in kind of this larger group of 10 species. They were also then able to use the genetic data to uh, essentially show or convinced themselves that there was a sortative mating going on between these two, two groups. So basically, even though the females are indistinguishable between the two uh, species here, what they found is that the females that were mating with the orange males had basically a kind of an orange uh, genotype or they had the same kind of genes. If they were a male, they would be orange. So that's the way to put it. And the ones that aren't orange were mating with the males that are, that would not have, oh, sorry, that the non-orange males are mating with females that wouldn't be orange or wouldn't, well, they're not orange anyway, but they're basically mating with the same genotype. They somehow recognize that that's who they should be mating with. So it's interesting to me that they can find then this kind of trigger or at least a, a signature of this differentiation through the coloration but how does that, it's still a mystery to me, um, how does that female know that, have the pref, what, what's driving the preference for those females for either the orange or the non-orange bird based on that genotype? Not, not totally known. 
So that's what's kind of interesting. But that's really what they're kind of getting into here is how is that reinforced? How does it has this kind of initial speciation event happen? And the coloration is at least part of the trigger uh, that's pushing it forward. Mm -hmm. Any questions there? And you can, so, and this is one example. There's many actually uh, examples where uh, these kind of initial speciation events are um, tied to a coloration difference. Of course, as uh, field observers, how would you know if they're two different species if both birds or sets of populations looked exactly the same? You would have no kind of visual clue to figure that out. So the, the genetics is kind of reinforcing what we're seeing um, and just gives us a, a more molecular basis for how that's happening, where these alleles are coming from, kind of the history of the events. We could talk about this more in the question and answer session, but it certainly leads to the question is, I mean, we really can't say what a species is anymore. These two or three uh, seed eaters, or maybe all 10 of them, probably would make fertile offspring, which um, would go against the previous uh, older definitions of, of species. It's just that the color is the, the recognition of color is what's separating them out. And, um, and even that is just a minuscule part of the whole genome. It's uh, amazing. That, that's what's remarkable. That in these very early times, the genomes are almost the same. And then the idea is that if you, once this kind of mating pattern is set up, it's getting reinforced by the coloration or whatever else, then the genomes will slowly diverge over time to the point where they, they would not be able to hybridize eventually. But that could take millions of years. So exactly, yeah. All right, see the next slide here. Okay, so second story I wanted to tell you uh, doesn't have quite as much to do with speciation, but still interesting and from a point of view of possible hybridization or polymorphism within a species. This is a, a white-throated sparrow. So um, I was a faculty member at Emory for a number of years doing genomic technology work. And there was a faculty member in the psychology department, Donna Manny, who was interested in behavioral neuroendocrinology and using kind of natural models. And I happened to get in touch with her because I thought she was working with zebra finch. And she said, oh no, they're boring. I've got a much more interesting system. So that's how we got involved with this. She's Great, uh, great scientist and uh, has some interesting articles about sex differences. And so if you happen to look her up, uh, very good colleague. Okay, so sorry, next slide. So I, again, I'm, I feel like I'm not really teaching much here. Here's the basic range for the white-throated sparrow. It would be in this area, right? Um, and again, there's essentially two morphs or phenotypes where you've got some birds have a kind of a more of a strong white stripe on their crown and some have a, a tan stripe. Okay, next one. So the, this is kind of interesting. There's uh, in the last example, what we saw is that the coloration essentially was being uh, driving what we call assortative mating, that the genotypes were finding each other and preferentially mating with the same genotype. That's actually not the case in this species. So there's about 50-50 population frequency of these two colors. All right, next. And but what and what was what was observed early on and was that white birds and tan birds were preferentially mating with each other. So in this study in a Canadian field site from 61, uh, Lothar noticed that again 96% of the matings were white and tan. So there was, if I remember correctly, an assumption that probably this was a, a sexual dimorphism, meaning maybe the males are white and the females are tan or vice versa. That was just the assumption. Uh, but it turns out that that's not the case. White stripes are equally male or female, same for tan. So there's no sexual dimorphism. You can have either white striped males or tan striped females or vice versa. So what you'd expect in that kind of scenario 
is actually if it was a randomly breeding population that you would see all, all the combinations of white stripe and tan stripe um, matings at essentially equal frequency. So this observation that 96% of the matings were between white and tan is a massive shift from what's randomly expected. And so that's what is, uh, in this case, why it's called disassortive mating. So there's clearly a preference for the tan birds to mate with the white striped birds and vice versa. All right, next, next slide. So back in 1966, a graduate student, again, up in Canada, used the modern, you know, the most modern genomic techniques that were available at that time, and he looked at the chromosomes. So the karyotype that we saw pictures of earlier, he said, well, and maybe there was some experience about chromosomal polymorph or differences in chromosomes within a species linked to a phenotype, but it's pretty rare. You're not, not expected to look at a chromosome level and see a correlation between a phen the phenotype or the traits and what the chromosomes look like, but that's what he saw. So he observed on the second largest chromosome that the white birds had <clears throat> uh, what was called a normal chromosome two, which is on the left. The tan birds had two normal chromosome twos, and then the white bird had one that looked different. And the reason why it looks different is that part of that uh, chromosome, the, kind of the constriction here is called the centromere. And if you just imagine kind of cutting the chromosome here and here and then flipping it around, it inverted. So this is called a chromosomal inversion. So this is, uh, happens occasionally. You see these large polymorphisms or differences between chromosomes, even within a species. They're not real common, but they're certainly present. But this one was pretty remarkable because it correlated with the uh, plumage. All right, next slide. Next, yeah, thanks. So this kind of explained the maintenance of the frequency of these two colors in the population. When these birds would mate, white and tan, uh, you would expect from this genotype, you're gonna get 50% of the birds are gonna have the two normal chromosomes, say the, the ZAL2s, and they're gonna be tan, and then 50% are gonna be uh, white because they carry one of these inverted chromosomes. So pretty, uh, very interesting set up here, not, not very usual. All right, next one, stop. So the other, the aspect of what my collaborator, Donna Maney was interested in was this uh, color polymorphism, again, probably because it's present, uh, <clears throat> they were able to observe a correlation between the color polymorphism and parental behavior. These are gross oversimplifications of the parental phenotypes, but in general, the white stripe morph was, would sing more, um, basically were more aggressive, uh, sometimes polygamous, more exoparic copulations, territorial intrusions, just more of kind of a, an aggressive phenotype or trait or uh, behavior. Tan stripe birds, on the other hand, are essentially more maternal or maternalistic, uh, less aggressive in terms of vocalization. I wouldn't take much about the monogamous thing, more mate guarding, more provisioning of the young. So they have essentially uh, are representing kind of opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of reproductive or parental behavior. All right, next. And I put this in here. I made this slide a while back. I'm not sure how much, this is kind of a, it's a tough time to say what's a stereotypical male, but if you went back to the 40s and the 50s or the 60s, uh, somebody like Frank Sinatra, kind of a fighter, a womanizer, you might say he's kind of stereotypical male behavior, probably not a great dad, although I don't want to cast any dispersions on Frank Sinatra. On the other end of the parental spectrum, you have someone like Mia Farrow, very maternal, adopted many children, probably a great mom. And you say, well, why bring up this example? Well, they're at opposite ends of the spectrum, but in fact, uh, these two were married for a time. So in this case, it's uh, an example of opposites attracted, which was kind of comparable to what these uh, birds were doing. Anyway, excuse, that's my- Excuse me. You yes. said the uh, white stripe morph appears 50-50, male and female. So these attributes you're putting about, um, you know, more um, 
extra pair copulation, more territorial intrusions. Does that just apply to the males, the white striped males? So the the these are kind of at the edges of the spectrum. So if you took a, a white female, she would be moving more towards um, being less parental, I guess is the best way to put it. Does that make sense? And then the tan male would be moving towards being more maternal than the white male. So these two are at the far end of the spectrum. And then the other, the other two would be kind of in, in the center. So it applies in some ways to both of them. The description is more based on the, the males here, but it's, it applies to both sexes, yes. All right, next slide. So you can go ahead and hit like the next four buttons, I think, Scott. So this is a really interesting system because it's an example of balancing selection. And all that means is essentially you're maintaining, there's part of the uh, process of maintaining variation in the population. Again, in that speciation event we saw with the seed eaters, you're actually pushing it apart, that that's what's main, pushing them to speciate. In this case, you're trying to keep that variation in one population. Uh, again, it's connected to plumage, uh, reproductive strategy, and mate choice. So it was a very interesting uh, uh, genetic system to understand what, what's driving those differences on a genetic basis. Okay, next one, Scott. So after I had uh, come to the NIH, another group ended up doing a reference genome for this white-throated sparrow. They did the same kind of story as the seed eater where they're sequencing white and tan birds. They're looking for where the genomes differ. One of the things about an inversion is that when it flips around, it basically shelters that stretch of the chromosome from mixing with the, the, normal, the normal chromosome. So basically there's a set of alleles or variation of genes that are only present in the white birds. So that's kind of a special property of these inversions. And so they were able to see it based on kind of the signature and the, and the A, you see that kind of the, the left, the white box there is showing that there's really no um, variation between the white and the tan birds outside of the inversion. And then as soon as you move into that pink area, the differences go up quite a bit. So they were able to physically define that segment of the chromosome that flipped around contains about a thousand genes, which is a lot, right? 5% of all genes are within this inversion. And so you can't, you know, it's not really practical to, and because of this inversion, it's, it's hard to whittle down which genes are likely to be involved using standard genetic methods where you might do, uh, anyway, so you're kind of stuck. But they, they've looked at Donna and others, um, at genes that are known to influence behavior that fall within this region. And what they believe is going on here is that differences in how much and where in the brain some of these genes are expressed between the white and the tan birds is the likely genetic mechanism for this behavioral difference. I mean, that might you know, be surprising that it goes back to the brain, but essentially that inversion then is facilitating that uh, variation in behavior. All right, next slide, Scott. So there's still some open questions about this inversion. Uh, you know, where did it come from? It turns out that the number of differences between that inverted and normal chromosome are higher than you would expect for uh, a typical, to be within a certain species. So it's possible that there was a hybridization event that created this system that, and then somehow got propagated uh, over time. Again, it's not totally clear. That's probably the best guess. There's obviously, I mentioned a lot of birds have been sequenced. They have not found, you know, the, the quote, the donor species yet. So it might not be around anymore. Um, it could be that this polymorphism, these two different chromosomes actually have been uh, in this kind of setup for a long time, but all the other closely related birds to the white-throated sparrow don't have this polymorphism. So it's, 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 it's possible that it just, was maintained in the white-throated sparrows, but lost in the others. Uh, but that seems less likely than a hybridization event. Now, I, and I just wanted to bring this back to uh, a, an analogous system, uh, the roughs. So 
uh, there is basically a hypothesis that, again, this inversion system underlying the mating differences in the white-throated sparrow uh, result, are a result of alterations in steroid hormone pathways. And it's also possibly true in the ruffs. And why would I mention ruffs here? They're not anything like a sparrow, <clears throat> but they also have um, basically three different, quote, types of males in that species that are morphologically different and have deep, different reproductive strategies. And they also happen to be um, correlated with the presence or absence of one of these inversions. So it's a second example of how this specific type of genomic change can lead to quite a bit of variation uh, within a species in you know, complex behavior like reproduction. All right, next slide, Scott. So hopefully I've convinced you that uh, genome sequencing and genetics is relevant to birds. You can answer questions about speciation or what is a species. To me, it's really exciting that the genetic basis for these traits and wild animals can be found using these technologies that were really developed you know, in the context of sequencing the human genome. Now you can apply it to any species you want. I think it's very exciting that field work is incorporated and really required for these studies. You know, the premise for asking these questions using these technologies is based on what people are seeing in the field. It's really about the biology. How can you apply these genomic technologies to the exciting biology you see out in the wild? And then lastly, it's just, I just wanna say that it's not easy to definitively show that a lot of these genetic changes are influencing these traits. It's, you know, the genetics is a very strong um, evidence, but these are not model systems. As you know, you're not bringing these birds in the lab per se. You're not doing uh, mating systems or uh, mating colonies with them like you could do for a mouse or something like that. So it, it's challenging to go all the way to the point to know for sure that these changes are modulating the phenotypes, but uh, these are very exciting possibilities uh, to look at in the future and, and how can you build systems that really would help you understand and, and tease apart how the exact genetic mechanisms for all these differences that you see in the birds. All right, and I think that's, I think that's all I got, Scott. Great, thank you very much. Happy, awesome. Like I said, happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, unless it gets overcrowded, people can just uh, unmute and ask a question and we'll see how it goes. And remember, you're you're the experts on the birds. So <laughs> So when you showed the rups, uh, so what is their mating? Are the, or are they really distinct species? They're, they're, well, someone may know more about this. They're, they're basically that's the Lex system where they're, all these males are competing in a, in a kind of a group setting. And they basically take on different reproductive strategies. They're within the same species. That's again, that's what's really interesting about them is it's not different species. Now, if you were looking at them, you might think they were based on morphology, but the genetics and everything else tell you that they're, they're the same species. Just that major polymorphism makes a difference. And the three types are relatively successful uh, are comparably su successful? Well they're, well, they're certainly maintained. I mean, I think that's the key thing is that, you know, what we see has probably been around a long time and there's something about it that's keeping it there. Yeah, that's um, so they, they're always competing in different ways, right? All these alleles or these variations are trying to survive as long as they can in the population. One thing about how species emerge has always puzzled me. I mean, presumably, uh, um, even in allopatric populations, uh, a difference arises maybe once. Um, if it's advantageous, I mean, if it's not advantageous, it's clearly, so to speak, not a problem with regard to speciation. But how does it spread? I mean, if you've got one individual with one advantageous uh, mutation, I can see that that would affect its progeny. But unless then it interbreeds, unless you have a very 
similar or identical mutation in some other individuals, what's to prevent it from just being diluted out or essentially disappearing? Right. And you're, you're touching on like, you know, one of the greatest mysteries that they talk about in evolutionary biology is exactly that. How does it, how does it get started? You know, even a, like we talked about kind of different species have different, maybe different numbers of chromosomes or changes in the chromosomes. Again, same kind of thing. How does that propagate to the point where it's not just in the population, but actually gets to the point where every bird in that population has a different set of chromosomes than it started with. So it, it's still a mystery. You know, hybridization possibly gives you uh, an avenue in which it might be repeatedly certain genetic um, alleles or variants or advantageous mutations or repeatedly pushed into a population. So it may not just be a one-off event, but that's, you know, not, not a full answer to your question. It's, it's still a mystery. And that's why it's evolutionary biology. Uh, I had someone tell me at some point when I was, getting into it is like, well, it's never really totally satisfying because <laughs> you never really totally know the answer. You're inferring a lot of stuff and you can learn a lot, but you can never really totally get to the answer. But that's one of the great mysteries of, of biology for sure is how do, how do these things speciate? And again, what, you know, back to the coloration, how does that female with the genotype that would say she should be orange, why does she prefer the orange male? Just, you know, I don't know. Oh, I think it's a little easier to understand it if you think that uh, um, the same species got separated geographically and then at each place they started um, getting smaller, I mean, repeatedly smaller changes that didn't affect their ability of the population to progress. That, but that over you know, 10,000 or a million years, then they, they were completely different from the original group that they left from. But now that you have these cases like the seed eaters that can change rapidly just because there's a color change, but not probably anything to do with their um, maybe other behaviors that, you, that we can tell at this point, it makes it really hard to, to see how that happened so quickly, I guess. Right, yeah, the, the island model is easier to visualize that the same population, they end up on two separate islands and they don't see each other for a couple million years. And over that amount of time, enough genetic mutations just naturally accumulate that they can't come back together and hybridize. But that's more of a passive project process almost versus kind of an active thing that has to be occurring to push it forward when there's still the opportunity to interbreed. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, um, this is Francis. Um, I don't have a science background and I attended a meeting of the Northern Virginia Bird Club maybe five, six, seven years ago um, where a um, scientist from the Smithsonian spoke about something similar to this talk. He talked about um, mannequins and how there were lecks of two species of mannequins that were very close together um, and occasionally one individual from each lek would um, interbreed. And if I recall correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, are, are you familiar with, with these studies before I continue? No, that's okay. No, no the I whole have thing? Yeah. Um, I don't know if there was, a, there was a video called Moonwalking Mannequin where the biologist was moonwalking with the mannequin and she's one of the people that was studying it. And I can't think of her name right now, but um, they did DNA studies on these hybrid birds and found that, say, the, say there was a red cap mannequin and the golden headed mannequin, I think, and the bird that looked like the red cap mannequin actually had the other species DNA. Mm -hmm. And the, well, the question I was left with, and I think the point of the talk was like looking at a bird or looking at two species, so you think, you know, you're in Panama or Costa Rica or somewhere looking at the mannequins, it's not actually those species from the appearance of the bird. And I'm not sure I got that right, but. Well, there, again, there, yeah, for sure the, the, the DNA really, especially if you have kind of, kind of confirmed um, samples or reference genomes from say two species, and you, and you take one that's a hybrid or you're not quite sure what's going on and you, and you compare it back to those reference genomes, you, you should be able to kind of 
accurately, the DNA will really accurately tease apart what kind of the origin is of that one bird is for sure in a, in a very, um, again, agnostic way. So it, it is very interesting how the DNA can be used to, to do that kind of thing. You know, another aspect about hybridization is sometimes it looks like it's more one direction. So you have one population that <clears throat> is, looks like it's contributing more uh, segments of the DNA to another species and it's not going the other direction. So those are the kind of things you can see with the, with the sequencing as well. So it's, you know, but you guys are just, I think, incredible at recognizing these birds. And I, you know, the DNA, I think would basically always be right. Well, depending on how you, how you used it and you, I, you, you guys would probably be 97% right or maybe higher. I don't know, but it, it's remarkable that, uh, uh, and kind of in both directions, you can correlate that. I think that's what's fun. And maybe that mannequin story, is, it's, that's why it's kind of fun, is it, there's surprises, basically, that you can see in the DNA that you may not be able to see with your eyes. I like the, uh, the quote that, um, that Janet put up on the chat. <clears throat> it says, in the 18th century, the Count de Buffon, or de Buffon, wrote that species are varieties differing due to diet, climate, and degenerate reproduction. Birds' temperament sometimes perverts their instincts and gives birth to unnatural progeny that serve to increase the confusion. <laughs> so, science in the old days. <laughs> uh, I was wondering whether um, the may preference differences in the females could be explained not by the genetics, but simply by their um, experiences early in life. What, who was at their nest and what songs they heard. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And then, and then you're kind of stuck. Then the genetics may not tell you as much other than that you know that that bird had that early life experience because it has that genotype, right. But then you have cases like the, the brown-headed cowbirds that are raised and by other birds, but somehow manage to become cowbirds in the end. So, <laughs> it's... I had someone ask me a question once uh, in terms of the white-throated sparrows. In, in essence, how does a bird know that it's tan or that it's white? <laughs> And that would be, then it would be attracted to the other. You know, it's like one of these metaphysical kind of questions. I don't, I don't know how to even answer that, right? It's a really good point. <laughs> but if the behavior is different, then maybe that's a clue that each one is looking for somebody that's different. You know, right. they're, they're, they're doing the opposites attract thing. Sure. So that, that even makes a certain amount of sense, I guess. Yeah, well, sure. isn't, it, isn't it possible? Go ahead. Well, I just said you showed three genes that were tracking with the change. Only two were implicated in color. So what does the third gene do? For the seed eaters, right. Yeah, that was on, I think the third was on the one of the Z, the Z chromosome. And whether that, they, they weren't 100% sure. They kind of speculated that that might influence um, viability, that there's often genetic incompatibilities build up first on the, the sex chromosomes per se. Mm -hmm. So that might be a signature of what's happening there. They weren't sure. They weren't sure. But that's the, kind of the open question is, is there something there that again is influencing the choice that's unrelated to the coloration? So do you know if the 4% of the white-throated sparrows that are not tan cross white, um, do they make fertile offspring? Do they know that? So the, the, there are very, very few white striped birds that have two copies of that inverted chromosome. So the, they are present in the population. We found, I think Donna found one amongst like 500 birds. So really rare. So that indicates that they're probably not highly viable, that particular. And so that's partially what's maintaining those white birds is essentially heterozygous because it's likely that if they had two copies of the, that chromosome, they would not necessarily be viable. 
yeah, so there is certainly some sort of uh, viability issue there, possibly with that inverted chromosome. Does that play out as far as seeing the number of white birds versus tan birds? Because you'd expect to see less white birds, at least at some small percentage. Sure. So that's that was that because it's always white and tan, and basically they're that set up in the mating mm -hmm. that it, it, it still stays at about 50-50. It's mm -hmm. just that if it was again a kind of a random mating population, then you would you would you would definitely see a decrease. Um, yeah, in the number of white versus tan, I think. That that Thanks. Thanks. Okay, super. Thank you again, Jim. Um, I had a great time. Hopefully, we'll great. see you out on the uh, the birding trips too. You can. You, I, I saw that you know you mentioned Redgate and uh, maybe Blue Mash. I play a lot of golf. So I see a lot of birds on the golf course. So I might see you tangentially, okay. <laughs> but that would be fun. I hope to see you out there. Okay, good. <laughs>